is one that um, I think needs a lot of, uh, it needs to be promoted a lot more than it, uh, than it is, particularly in the day in which we live. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your guidance, your direction. I thank you for being so loving, so caring, being there for us in the good times and the bad. Father, we lift you up and we praise your name, the creator of heaven and earth who provided Jesus Christ, who provided the savior of the world to be our substitute, the creator of the universe that planned everything and knew that there would be an opportunity someday for us to have eternal life. And you've given us through your word the way of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I ask, Father, that we can just take the next few moments and thank you and praise you for what you do for us day by day. Use us, make us open vessels today as you speak to our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to have you take your Bible and read, where we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18 and verses 12, 13, and 14. Gospel of Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 12. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which had not gone astray. So it is not the will of your father, so is it not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish? We've had a very interesting and in some ways very trying week. This past week uh, we've learned of individuals that uh, I know that uh, have been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, one pastor, uh, his cancer has reoccurred. Uh, another pastor's wife uh, fell, anticipating having cancer surgery. That's going to have to be postponed because she's got to have rotator cuff surgery first and then follow up with uh, cancer surgery. Uh, we learned in the recent weeks, Cheryl and I, that our house deal fell through. We went and saw a number of different houses. We were all excited about one, and then it fell through, and I know there were different people that were a little disappointed. Well, those are just small things. And then this week, the whole world is turned upside down in Paris, France. When so many people are killed, wounded, and maimed, we can be overcome with discouragement, frustration, disillusioned. We can be beset by our personal struggles, whether they be uh, health or financial or marital. And I saw that there is a need that we need to talk about how great God is. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen? Amen. Say that again. God is good. And all the time, God, He is all the time, God is good. And God has created everything through Jesus for our benefit. He wants us as His children. God's love is so immense. There's the one song we sang, the first song in the hymn book. If the, if the oceans, if you could write the love of God, 
there wouldn't be enough water in the oceans, enough room in the sky. God's love is so great, so powerful. And here we have a story here of an illustration of sheep, and we're sheep. Now, I don't know, any of you have ten sheep before? I never did, but I've heard they're kind of stupid. Don't know if that is accurate. But they follow one after another. And we, described in Scripture, are like sheep. We see a problem, we kind of gravitate to it sometimes. If you don't think that's true, watch sirens and police cars, listen for sirens and police cars and fire trucks, and people come out to their street, uh, to the end of the street to see where did they go. And if it's anywhere close, they'll walk down to see what's going on. We feed on disaster. And I love having a good story sometimes finally being told on the news. We need good news. And good news is God loves you. Now, God is a jealous God. He doesn't want any other gods before you. But I want you to know that God indeed has a wonderful plan for your life. And he wants each and every one of us to be a part of his eternal kingdom. He wants us to have eternal life. Life today is not all there is. Uh, Jim mentioned we need to laugh at ourselves. And that is absolutely so true. I saw, I saw one uh, note. I copied it. It said, we need to laugh at ourselves. You need to be able to laugh at yourself. Now, if you don't feel you can laugh at yourself, call me. I'll laugh at you. <laughs> and people, I, I make a lot of uh, fun and jokes about myself that I enjoy. And it makes other people appreciate being around people that have a good sense of humor, tell jokes, have a good outlook on life. Now, somebody that has a kind of a pessimistic outlook on life, somebody that's, uh, and if you see that individual, if you know anybody like that, when you ask them, how are you, and they tell you, they're the ones you kind of say, well, no, 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 you want to go the other way. But we need to be interested in people and let them know that they are indeed loved. The people around the world need to know that God loves them. There is a God in heaven that cares for each and in every individual on the planet, no matter what their race, color, ideologies, their own personal religions. God still loves them, but he wants all individuals to come to an understanding of Jesus Christ, his son, who is the savior of the world. Now in this passage here, we're like sheep. And in Jesus' day, the shepherds sometimes did communal shepherding. There'd be two, three, or four shepherds that would get together, and they would, their flocks would graze in the same general area, and they'd talk together. They'd spend time together. So when the illustration that is given there in the passage of one sheep going away, it was easy for a shepherd to go after the one while the others tend to the 99, as the parable gives. If there was only one shepherd and he left, the sheep would follow him and the rest of the sheep would be in trouble. So they, they worked together and that one sheep was vitally important. There are pictures that have been drawn, pictures that have been painted that show Jesus as the good shepherd. Some pictures of him rescuing a sheep with his staff, with the, the crook and, and the staff. 
another one with uh, a lamb over his shoulders as he's bringing the sheep, uh, that particular sheep back to the fold. It's a picture of someone who is deeply in love with those in his care. God is deeply in love with each one of us and he wants each and every one of you to have eternal life. He cares about you. He's concerned about your struggles. He's concerned, maybe you haven't gone astray, but he's concerned about your aches and pains, the things that bother you, the things that bother your family, the, thing, the, your, the issues that might affect you spiritually, physically, or even mentally. God is interested in every facet of your life. Now, in Isaiah chapter 53, we have a passage that deals with the suffering Savior. Isaiah chapter 53, and if you have your Bibles or an iPad or a phone or something that you can click on and turn to Isaiah 53 and verse 6, This is depicting Jesus in prophecy. And the scripture says, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus is the one pictured in, in Isaiah 53. All of mankind has strayed from the fold. The Garden of Eden was a testing ground. The Garden of Eden was a testing ground where, we, uh, where man was put in the garden to tend the garden. And the serpent tempted Eve with a forbidden fruit. God said you will not eat of that particular fruit. Now, I want you to notice something in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, this is a story of creation. And at the end of the creation, at the end of chapter 1, the general creation of the world, all six days, 31 says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, you can read chapter 1 and you can read the, the creation on the first day. God saw it was good. You can see the creation on, verse, on the second day. God saw things were good. Third day, so forth. And on this last day, this, sec, this sixth day, it was not only good, but it was very good. And included in that creation was his creation of mankind. God created us good. You need to remember that. That is important for the next statement, the next phase. This was a testing ground. God made everything good. He created man, and it was good. And the creation of woman in chapter 2, what chapter 2 of Genesis is actually, is the sixth day of creation in chapter 1 put under a microscope. So you just focus in just on that sixth day. And God created the man, God created the woman in his own image. He put the breath of life in the human beings that he created. And they were good, and they were very good. But we get to chapter 3 in Genesis, and Eve is tempted. And she says, she is asked, is it true that you can't, that you can't eat of a certain tree? She, the, the one in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we can't eat it. The serpent said to Eve, when he asked about that, Eve said, if we eat it, we're going to die. Remember that? Ver chapter 3, if you eat this forbidden fruit, God says we're going to die. The serpent says, listen to the lie, you will not die. You will not die. But your eyes will be opened. God knows that your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. What the serpent is in essence saying to Eve, you're not good enough. 
You're not like God. You could be better. So if you eat this, you're not going to die. God knows that your eyes will be opened. He's actually saying, you're not good enough. Which is, of course, a lie. Now when Eve ate of this forbidden fruit, her eyes were open. She realized what she did. She realized, and Adam ate the forbidden fruit too. Their eyes were open. They realized their situation, and the first thing that they do, they hide. They hide. And God begins a search. Now, like God didn't know where they were. Where are you, Adam? And he said, well, I... I I hid because I was, I was naked and I was afraid. Who told you you were naked? Adam and Eve knew what they did, and they knew what was wrong. This was a testing ground, and they failed. Now I want to move up into time to the Garden of Gethsemane. Here's another garden. Here's another testing ground. Here's another person that's being put to the test. And Jesus is an individual who is about to die. He knows what's coming. He was aware of this. But he had a choice just like Adam and Eve. His, the Garden of Gethsemane was Jesus' testing ground. If you look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, this is, uh, I, this is foundational when it comes to the teaching about the death, burial, and resurrection. First of all, it was in the middle of Jesus' ministry, about halfway through. And so Jesus begins at that time, verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders. And I'm going to come back to that. But notice it says from that time Jesus began to show the disciples that he was going to suffer. Well, this is halfway through his ministry. What's he been doing the first half? He's been talking about the coming kingdom of God. Jesus didn't come just to do three days' work, death, burial, and resurrection. He came to show what the kingdom of God was like. He came to show people what God was like. No person can see God. No person can visually see God and live. Jesus, God's only begotten Son, demonstrated what God was like, what God expected, what God wanted them to do. And he talked about the kingdom of God. He demonstrated the kingdom of God through his miracles. And then in the middle of his ministry, he begins to talk about his suffering, that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed and be raised on the third day. That's the whole thing there. There's the three days. He knows what's going to happen. So now Jesus is in his testing ground in the Garden of Gethsemane, already knowing that if, we, if this is successful, resurrection is on the other side of the cross. We have a very, very important passage in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Now this is sometimes a passage that gets twisted, taken out of context, and totally misunderstood. But this is a passage in, that Paul talks about the humility that each of us need to have and to be, um, to be humble and have the same mind like Jesus Christ. Jesus was in a testing ground. Adam and Eve, in their testing ground, they failed. Satan had told Eve, you won't die. Matter of fact, because you're not good enough, your eyes will be opened and you will then be like God. In Jesus' testing ground, look what he says. Although he existed in the form of God, he was God's agent, he, was just, he showed by his life and his character and the way he acted and reacted, he showed what God was like. <clears throat> he, 
He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. It wasn't his. It wasn't, he shouldn't take that. He was good enough as he was. Jesus remained humble. As a servant, he took on the responsibility that God had given him to go to the cross and die. He was good enough just the way he was for that point. He was sinless. He wasn't perfect. He was sinless. Hebrews chapter 5 will bear that out if you want to write that down and check it out. Because Hebrews chapter 5 talks about that in the days of his flesh, he learned, he learned perfection through what he suffered. Ultimately, after dying, he was made perfect through the resurrection. Because if, you're, if you have no sin in your life whatsoever, but you're capable of dying, you've got a character flaw. And Jesus had that character flaw. He was sinless, but he wasn't perfect because he was capable of dying. But God had that planned. And Jesus knew to be equal with God, that's not for me. That's not why I'm here. That's not what my mission is. It wasn't something to be grasped. Because later on, after the resurrection, Jesus today now is immortal, like God. Someday we will be immortal, like God. Adam and Eve failed their test. Jesus won his exam. God's love is seen, and we've talked about other, ver <clears throat> there are other verses that talk about God's love. The most famous, one of the ones that is so often quoted, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. And he wants us to live. And he loves us so much that he gave Jesus to die for us. God turned his back on Jesus as Jesus died on the cross, an agonizing, horrific, horrible death. Why else did Jesus say, why hast thou forsaken me? God can't look upon sin, and momentarily God turned his back. Jesus took it upon, took all the sin of the world on himself, and he died. But God is patient. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 9, we see God, uh, God is patient. He's not slow as we might think to be slow. God loves us so much that he's kind of just taking his time. God's not slow about his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. He loves us, and so the shepherd is searching for sheep. The shepherd is out searching to bring in lost sheep. The love of God is an individual love. The 99 wasn't enough. One was still lost, and each and every individual is important to God. God's love is a patient God. Yeah, the sheep are kind of foolish. They're going to follow one another, and if one falls over the cliff, you know, another one's going to follow, God, another follow, and follow, so forth. In, in our opinion, man's opinion, sometimes we'll look at an individual who's made foolish decisions, and we might come up with the idea, he's an idiot. He should have known better. He brought that on himself. But in God's eyes, God still loves the foolish sinner. Sometimes we'll look at an individual, and we'll make a judgment call, unfortunately. Mankind can do that. We're very capable of making stupid decisions. And we'll look at that individual and he said, I don't want to witness to that one. I really, he's not my kind of person. I, don't, I wouldn't waste my time on him. But I'm thankful that God wasted his time on me. Each of us are a soul for whom the Lord Jesus died. And God loves you immensely that 
over the pure passage of time, someone shared the gospel message of Jesus Christ with you. You're here because somebody shared Jesus Christ with you. You may have grown up in the church, you may be new to the church, but somebody took the time to share the gospel with you. I told somebody that when I was a little boy I had a drug problem. My mom and dad drugged me to church whenever they could. They drugged me uh, to Sunday school, they drugged me to church, and uh, we even went a long distance for mission meetings. They drugged me to general conference. And the knowledge of God and his son Jesus Christ was ingrained and taught and drilled to the point I learned the importance of it. That's why you're here, to learn and to praise God for all that he's done because God is a loving God. But God's love is also a seeking, uh, a seeking love. The shepherd goes out to lurk for the, search for the lost ones. It's not a case that years ago people have said, well, the church door is open. The people know the church is here and its doors are unlocked. You know, they can come. They know we're here. No, it's kind of not like that. It needs a one-on-one -on -one contact with individuals to let them know that you care. Yeah, God loves us. God loves you. Well, that's fine to say, but if somebody comes into church and uh, God loves you, I don't much care for you. Well, that's going to easily be seen. So we need to love people ourselves as God loves people. Love the unlovable. As one guy said, I'll love them even if they ain't no good. We're gonna, you need to learn to appreciate the good in people because there's good in every individual. Their ideas may be different than yours. You might see, not see eye to eye in a lot of situations, but there's still a breathing individual for whom the Lord Jesus died and God wants them in his kingdom. And he has given you the message of reconciliation to let them know that he is loved. Jesus' mission from Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says that Jesus' mission, the, uh, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Seek and to save that, that which is lost. Do you know, stop and think, do you know anybody that in your humble opinion that if Jesus were to come today, would not be in God's kingdom. Now, I know we don't make the ju judgment. And we don't know who those, all, all those individuals are. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But if you look at their life, you look at how they live, the things they say, the where places they go, is there anybody that you know that you're pretty confident that if Jesus were to come today, they would not be in the kingdom of God? They were lost. Well, then you need to get to know that individual. Get acquainted with them. Mentor them. Develop a relationship with them. We, want, we plant a seed, we water the seed, but it's not your responsibility to drag them into church. You be an influence on them. God brings the increase. And if you are influential in, in bringing people to an understanding of who you are and what Jesus Christ has done for you, God will be working in that individual as well. You be the example. And yes, it'll probably, hopefully, prayerfully, bring people into church. But what you're wanting to do most importantly is bring people into a relationship one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and his son Jesus Christ. It's that relationship that is so vital. Because you can have all the theology up here and be able to spout it out one doctrine after another. But if you're not living it here and loving the people that don't know, we're going to be perhaps missing our salvation by 12 inches. You got it here, but you don't have it here. And you need it here also even if they ain't no good. And I say that jokingly, 
because that's sometimes our opinion. They ain't no good. But God loves them, and he will teach us to love those as well. God's love is a rejoicing love. It entails complete forgiveness. We often accept people, but we don't forget the past. We remember what they do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it mentions our responsibility of being uh, given the ministry of reconciliation, and God is not keeping track. He's not keeping score of our mistakes. God loves us. He really does. The love of God's been extended to a fallen race. Through Christ, the Savior of all men, there's hope in saving grace. The flowers blooming in the spring, the heavens up above, in silent declaration, they tell the story of God's love. The love of God is so great. He loves you immensely. We're going to sing our closing song. It's an old chorus that if, if it seems unfamiliar to you, the tune will be bringing it right back. It's called, For God So Love the World. You'll, when you hear the tune, I'm sure you'll remember the song. For God So Love the World. <laughs>